Okay, I think um, we can start so long. So, um, welcome everybody. This is Wednesday Teaching. This is a special day today. It's an International Emergency Care Day. Uh, I bet you didn't know that, Karim. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we, we, we have a little short segment that we're going to play after the talk, um, and then we uh, just to segue into the next session. Um, without further ado, I'd just like to introduce our speaker today. So we have Karim today, who's a cardiology fellow at Tigerberg. Um, Karim is, uh, he's got a, um, an interest in myocarditis. He's an excellent presenter. He has more frequent flyer miles than anybody I know for presenting at conferences. Probably kept SAA afloat single-handedly, and now that he's stopped, look what happened. Um, so I'm just going to let Karim introduce himself, uh, you know, tell us why he got into myocarditis, maybe a, a word, uh, something cool about him, and then um, to continue his presentation. Thanks, Karim. Well, oh, thanks. Uh, thanks, guys. Thanks for the invite and opportunity. I'm not sure what qualifies me to give you this talk, but, you know, um, I mean, I, I got into this whole myocarditis thing um, as part of my research. That's sort of what my info is on. It was something that was probably lacking a bit of uh, space in the cardiology department and, you know, just in the country in general. Um, there's not much interest in it, but, you know, the, the, the more we look into it, the more interesting it kind of gets, and I'll tell you a little bit about it. It can kind of look like anything, and I think for those that have uh, rotated through the, 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 the division will know that I only do two things around here. The one is endomyocardial biopsies, and the other one is order bone scans for amyloid studies, which Cumberland knows very, very well. Um, so uh, let me start. So... I'm just going to start off by talking about, you know, some of these early data that came out of China about cardiac injury um, associated with COVID infections. Um, they basically took a cohort of their patient and measured all their troponins and found that um, those with elevated troponin, so definition of cardiac injury in, in their sort of sense is elevated troponin, uh, and they found that the patient was, who are infected with COVID with troponin leaks tended to do a lot worse than those with ultraponin leaks. Um, I think it's a bit difficult to establish sort of a temporal relation in terms of, um, you know, whether you first have the trop leak and then you do worse or whether they just sicker patients because they tended to be more uh, ventilator dependent, they tended to have more severe infections. So a bit of a chicken and an egg thing, but there was definitely some signal that if you have a trop leak and subsequently they also looked at D-dimers and those type of things as we all know that potentially they have prognostic uh, implications. Um, I like this picture because it kind of shows you um, you know, in a very basic form as to the phases of the so-called COVID infection, starting off with acute sort of viral infection and viral response phase, which then moves them to the pulmonary phase. And the phase that we probably most interested in as cardiologists is this famous or infamous cytokine storm type of phase, which is when a lot of bad things happen. Um, and there are a couple of theories. I don't think anybody's been, you know, there's, there's, there's probably a million theories about what happens with COVID, and these things seem to change every day. Uh, I haven't, you know, read much of it in the last week or two, but, you know, uh, when I last looked at it, this, uh, this was the ESC proposal as to the potential mechanisms of cardiac injury. Uh, I think some of it is quite obvious. For example, you know, if you have very bad pneumonitis, pneumonia, and you're on a ventilator, uh, if you have underlying coronary artery disease, chances are you're going to have a supply and demand issue, so-called type 2 infarct. We also know that inflammation generally is very bad um, for these plaques which live inside your coronary arteries. Uh, they make them tend to, to, to be more prone to rupture and those type of things. And that is another theory as to perhaps why um, people uh, with COVID tended to have more acute coronary syndromes and, 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 and cardiac injuries. Uh, furthermore, the, the, in, the inflammation issue can also affect the microvascular circulation. Uh, and, you know, Kamlin talked about uh, the other day in, in communication with me about myocardial stunning and those type of things, and that's probably what it relates to. Uh, what interests me the most is this thing at the bottom, myocarditis, and, and that's interested a lot of people worldwide. You know, a lot of people have tried to prove uh, COVID-19 myocarditis, and it's quite a, quite a, you know, quite a, 
interesting theory. I think the one thing we all know by now is that uh, COVID gets access to your cells via this ACE2 inhibitor, I mean, ACE2 inhibitor, ACE2 receptor. Uh, um, and these ACE2 receptors are quite, you know, there, there's quite a few of them on the cardiac myocytes. Uh, and one would think that, you know, that's how you access the pneumocytes, et cetera, et cetera. There is also potential for you to access the uh, cardiac myocytes in that regard. Furthermore, I think with uh, with the previous SARS pandemic and also the, the MERS outbreak, um, there were cases which were proven um, to cause myocarditis or direct myocarditis as a result of the virus itself. Now, um, so yeah, sorry, that's uh, so. Uh, where I get a lot of in my information these days is uh, cardio Twitter, which I think has an impact factor that's greater than the MEJM. You know, if, you know, everybody can post something on cardiac Twitter and it's fantastic. And there's sort of been an outbreak of these uh, Takotsubo cases. Um, you know, everybody gets COVID or is worried about COVID or is worried about something and they all get Takotsubo. Um, um, I don't know how true that is. Uh, perhaps spending more time with your spouse on lockdown can also give you a bit of takotsubo. Um, but you know, I'm just saying there's a lot of information out there, and it's and it's quite difficult to, you know, you kind of need really need to keep your wits about you to to kind of um, uh, assess what is true and what is just by incidence. And I think a lot of these takotsubo are just by incidence. Anyways. Um, so there are actually uh, published cases, uh, multiple published cases in various journals of the so-called COVID myocarditis. Most of the earlier cases were proven either with imaging, so somebody that had a COVID infection, a troponin leak, um, they did an echo and they did normal motion abnormalities, or they managed to put the patient through an MRI scanner, there were MRI um, um, evidence of myocarditis. Um, or, you know, they just had unobstructed coronaries after having ST elevation and those type of things. And these cases are, 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 are very much out there. Um, however, you know, with myocarditis itself, um, you know, the mantra is no biopsy, no party, as I said earlier. Um, and the only way that we can prove direct causal relationship and the fact that there is myocarditis is by endomyocardial biopsy. Um, obviously, you know, in this group of patients, it's a bit difficult to get them to the cath lab, you know, PPE for everybody. Is it really worth it, those type of things? And the latest recommendation from the ESC is that we don't actually biopsy them. Uh, and I will tell you why that is. Um, but just to know that in, it is quite a low risk uh, um, uh, procedure as, as bad as it sounds, you know, we've, we've probably done close to maybe 80 or 90 RV biopsies now, and we haven't had any major complications, touch wood, uh, in our center. Um, this uh, was sent to me by Saad from Kailicha, I think it's about a month ago, now a young lady that presented um, with, uh, well, diagnosed with COVID and had a bad pneumonia, I think, uh, HIV negative, no comorbidities. They did a bedside echo with um, with a V scan and found that she had a very bad ventricle. She also had troponin leak, and this sort of uh, ECG with COVID, ST elevations, you know, anterior septal, bit of ST oppression here and there. Uh, unfortunately, she demised subsequently, and um, uh, we didn't manage to get her post mortem. So, you know, what caused all these things? It's still up for debate. Um, what we do know is there are two cases which actually had biopsies, which has been published. This is an Italian group um, that obviously admitted a, a, a patient with, with COVID, a troponin leak, you know, echo looked like a takotsubo. They injected her coronaries. Um, they were unobstructed. They decided to do a biopsy. Uh, and what they managed to find was that they um, were inflammatory myos uh, so inflammatory cells within um, uh, the in, uh, within the myocardium, so confirming myocarditis. Um, however, what was interesting is that they were not able to pick up any genetic material of the COVID. So COVID PCR was negative. So this was then 
presumed as a myocarditis on an inflammatory basis related to the cytokine storm. Uh, the patient was given steroids and IVIG and chloroquine and everything you can think of that's ever been described, and you know she improved as a result. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention is that what we are taught is that if, if there is a viral myocarditis, an actual virus proven viral myocarditis, you shouldn't immunosuppress them because it potentially makes it worse. Um, and then a second case also uh, coming out of Italy, the Italians love myocarditis and they love biopsying and they love partying as well. Um, this one was a bit more interesting. So on electron microscopy, they were actually able to demonstrate sort of these viral, the actual virus itself. So it looks a lot like, you know, the artist's impression of what COVID looks like. However, you know, um, the viruses were not seen in the cardiac myocytes itself, but they were seen in relation to macrophages which were in the area. Once again, I think this supports the fact that COVID myocarditis as a result of direct virus infiltration is probably not an entity and it's not believed that COVID causes a direct viral myocarditis, uh, but the viral my or the myocarditis is probably more related to the actual whole inflammatory cytokines and the cytokine storms and all those type of things. And that's why most of these patients are actually treated with high dose steroids and immunosuppression. And that seems to have a good effect and most of them recover their cardiac functions as a result. Um, so I'd sent me um, a publication subsequent to that because you know when, when I did this talk a couple of weeks ago, nobody could prove that there were any COVID in the cardiomyocytes. Um, but there was a small study, I couldn't uh, access the full text, unfortunately, a post-mortem study in Germany, I think of 12 patients uh, that died of uh, venous thromboembolism or pulmonary embolism, whatever it was, uh, that they managed to isolate um, the coronavirus within cardiac tissues. You know, the method which they did that, I'm not sure it's for supposedly RNA extraction or something like that. And whether those patients had any evidence of myocardial inflammation, I'm not sure. So, you know, from, from all, the all the evidence we have, and I think all the European um, experts all agree that there is no such entity as COVID-19 myocarditis. Uh, and that's why the ESC's latest recommendation is that we don't biopsy them because, you know, putting patient at risk, staff at risk, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, the one thing is it can be difficult, um, as I have alluded to before, to differentiate acute coronary syndrome from myocarditis, not just in the COVID era, even before the COVID era. You know, for those that have come through the, the corridors here, yeah, I'm sure you, you know, you would have been involved with a couple of patients with me where they present with AC elevation, looks exactly like a STEMI, they're given lysis, they're brought to the cath lab, but, you know, they have squeaky clean um, uh, coronaries and it ends up being a myocarditis. So it, it can be very difficult to differentiate to, to, and especially during the COVID era when we're trying to reduce exposure to to ourselves, to other staff, etc. You know, the, the, the distinction becomes even more important. I think the one thing for me, um, as a, as you know, if you don't remember anything else in this talk, is that. Um, Myocarditis that present as acute coronary syndromes generally have quite a favorable outcome, whereas those that have ST elevation myocardial infarction, if left untreated, you know, the outcome is very bad. And I think that we owe it to the patient to give them benefit of the doubt. Obviously, there are things that could help us um, uh, to differentiate the two. If the patients are unstable, you know, they obviously need to come to the cath lab. Um, and, you know, that we need to have a look whether COVID or non-COVID, we just all need to PPE. The other thing that I think we had an advantage of in South Africa is that we have a lot of experience with using um, lysis. Uh, we know that it works. We know that, we know that it works well. Uh, bleeding complication is probably less than 1% in total. And I think if you see a STEMI and you have a high suspicion that it is a STEMI, then you should give them lysis. I know the Europeans and the Americans have 
differing opinions about that, especially they feel that if somebody has myocarditis and not an actual occluded artery, that you're potentially harming them by giving them uh, lysis. But I, in our cohort of myocarditis patients, a lot of them have been lysed and they haven't had any complication in relation to the lysis, not to say it can't happen. Um, you know, I, I think for the stable patients, uh, we have a bit more time. So if they're successful lysis without pain, those type of things, then we probably do have time then to swab them if there's a clinical suspicion. Uh, we can also use uh, clinical judgment based on history, risk factors, obviously a 21-year-old girl who's never smoked in her life versus a 55-year-old hypertensive diabetic smoker, you know, you, you can clearly tell which one is more likely to have ruptured clot versus myocarditis. ECGs can be helpful. Um, the myocarditis we see you know, can look like, like a STEMI, but, you know, if the AC elevation is quite more widespread or those type of things and doesn't really obey a, a, a coronary territory, you have to think myocarditis. Um, bedside echo, we've started using these B-scans now, so you don't really need a very complicated um, um, echo to decide that you basically, all you need to look for is are we function? Um, all of the cases of myocarditis described with COVID has had globally impaired ventricles, um, usually with low EFs compared to an infarct which would obey a coronary territory essentially. So all you need is a V-scan, you know, an apical 432 chamber and you should have an answer. Um, also for the stable patient, you know, we, we as cardiologists can probably consider instead of bringing them all to the cath lab to just do something like a CT coronary angiograms or potentially putting through an MRI scanner. Um, each institute obviously have their own uh, protocol with regards to that. As the last part of my talk, I just thought I'd show a case that we actually saw here about two, three weeks ago. That's okay. I don't know how much time I have. I hope I'm not going over time. Um, um, so uh, this is a gentleman that was seen in Swellen Dam Hospital. He is a 61-year-old gentleman who is uh, hypertensive. Uh, he was driving a tractor, I think, on a Monday or something. Uh, and then got a, bit of, got a bit dizzy, got a bit of chest pain, felt unwell, and actually crashed his tractor into a fence uh, and cut his neck pretty badly. And that's why he ended up at Swellendam Hospital. Um, uh, so on presentation, he was cold and clammy. It was noted in the referral that he was cold and clammy. He was still awake and those type of things. Big gash in his neck, blood squirting out, etc. Uh, and then this ECG, I think... You know, with that sort of presentation, you uh, you know, this is a wide anterior stem. You know, you see reciprocal changes in the inferior leads. The S elevation looks very angry everywhere else. Um, and as benefit of the doubt, you know, I don't even think there is any doubt. This is an anterior stem until proven otherwise. Um, the, the one thing that Lloyd always tells me, and I always thought it was rubbish, um, is that there is no or there are no emergencies during a pandemic and i think that's something that's very important to remember uh we are all you know built in to jump and resus immediately when bad things happen uh, but i think in this COVID era one will really have to look after yourself before you look after the patient so uh and uh, this patient started going a bit downhill when they started the lysis um, he had about three episodes of VFRS, all requiring cardioversion, um, and he was intubated uh, because he became unresponsive. Obviously, at that time, uh, the, the treating physician didn't put on any PPEs and intubated, you know, sort of um, on the spot. Um, she did a very good job, I must say. Uh, they phoned us, and our, our, our obviously the guy was shocked. He was electrically unstable. He clearly had an anterior STEMI, and our advice to them was fly the patient over and we'll bring the patient immediately to the cath lab. Um, luckily, by the time he got to us, after about you know, 90 minutes after the lysis, he looked like he had a very good result. Uh, at this time, he was still intubated. Uh, we were not sure about COVID status because obviously all intubated patients are treated as PUIs. Um, he had a prolonged you know, cardiogenic shock type, uh, which has now subsequently resolved. So we weren't sure what his renal function looked like. 
uh, we thought that we should maybe give him some time, uh, get a, a creatinine back and those types of things. So if he becomes unstable, then we rush him to the lab. Uh, we also did a bedside e scan, which looked like an anterior stem. Unfortunately, I don't have pictures of that now. Um, and strangely enough, the next day, so that was Monday, Tuesday, he woke up and he was very awake and he was on invasive CPAP and he was almost jumping off the bed. So we decided to extubate him uh, with all PPE. COVID swap was still pending. Um, he also, his, you know, this uh, hematoma in his neck also started growing a little bit and you always worry about vascular injury if somebody has driven through a fence and is now getting due antiplatelets and had lysis and all sorts of things. Um, Extubated, sent to, sent to the CT scan. Uh, fortunately for him, he didn't have a vascular injury, but you can clearly see how much soft tissue swelling and sort of edema there is on the left side of the neck. Um, as we do these days, everybody who goes through a CT scan also get part of the lung scan, and there was this spot which was a question. Uh, at the time, it was interpreted as possibly COVID, but subsequent to that, it was decided that it's not COVID. Uh, but his swab obviously came back positive. So um, despite him denying any symptoms after we extubated him, we had a chat and he said he's never had symptoms, but his sons did say that he was actually ill for a couple of weeks before that. Um, so now we have COVID patient with the anterior STEMI, came in with very malignant cause, um, and that successfully we perfused and is reasonably stable. The question is what to do with him now. And I think as you know, reasonably young gentleman with such a malignant course of, of um, presentation, we had no choice but to bring him to the cath lab. And that is what we did with full PPE. We emptied out the lab one side as, you know, assigned for COVID where we had four people in there all with full PPE. Um, and I will just, you know, we can first look at the right coronary, um, which has, you know, moderate to severe disease, long segment from proximal to the mid vessel. Uh, but on the left system, this is what uh, angiographically you'd call Hruet Kak. I think that's what they call it in this part of the world. So it just had to be a left main. So yeah, I didn't show it very nicely on here, but, you know, he's got a proximal LAB culprit, but he's... The diameter of his left main is smaller than his proximal LAB. The pressure also has dropped, uh, you know, um, as you engage with the coronary catheters. And the cath lab becomes a very lonely place when you dress for in PPE, double mask and double glove. And, you know, you stay back into the window and everybody's got their thumbs up type of a thing and you're not sure what to do with your life. I think, you know, uh, it's, it's come up with a bit of a discussion in a patient, there's, there's a lot of debate in cardiology at the moment about left main disease. And I think for all intents and purposes, if this guy didn't have COVID, we probably would have sent him for surgery. Um, but because he has COVID and, you know, to reduce exposure, we decided to stent it. Um, okay, no, uh, sorry about that. Uh, we stuck wide, we stuck to wires in, we ballooned it, uh, looked a little bit better. Uh, we put a nice long stent all the way from the osteum up to his left main into the LAD. Uh, and then um, we post dilated a little bit. So, you know, we, we managed to get a good result. He was stable off the table. There is still some disease distorted that I can see Cumlin's uh, eye, you know, telling me that I didn't get a, do a good job and I left some disease behind. We, we were aware of that, but we thought we'd just get him off the table. Also, by this stage, my underwear was quite brown and, you know, the floor was quite messy and those type of things. So we, we managed to get him out of the lab um, and he was fine, you know, the next day we then discharged him out of cardiology and sent him to the COVID ward. Uh, he subsequently died. Um, he had a cardiac arrest about a week after that. Um, I'm not sure. I don't think he, he was sent for post-mortem. So we're not sure, you know, whether it's related to the stent. We had acute stent thrombosis, you know, because we know that these patients are more prone to clot, whether he shot the PE or something. He, he was apparently still on therapeutic clexane along with his due antiplatelets, um, but I suppose we will never know. Um, but anyway, uh, so in conclusion, um, you know, I, for those of you that watched my talk three weeks ago, I think Cumberland did, I left the slide blank because I wasn't sure how to conclude, and I'm still not sure how to conclude. I think, um, you know, these are crazy times. Uh, everybody's losing their minds. You know, we all worry for ourselves. We all worry for our patients. We all worry for our nurses. 
Um, and I, I, I think that we must all stay strong, you know, keep our wits about us and those type of things and um, filter sort of all the information that's out there and not just believe what everybody says. And I, I think that hopefully we'll see, we'll see better days uh, soon. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Geez, geez, thank you, thank you, Karim. Um, yeah, I mean, that that's an excellent. Um, I mean, we often, uh, if you haven't been to cardiology rotation, we never ever get to see cath lab results. We never see the end product of what we do, and we always get told by other people, "Oh, you sent us the wrong thing. You did the wrong thing." Um, you know, because of, there's a disconnect sometimes between your emergency care and, and, and what gets sent elsewhere. Can yeah, you hear me? No, Matt, that's UCT that tells you you're doing the wrong thing. No, we never tell you you're doing the wrong thing. <laughs> <laughs> no comment, no comment. Yeah. Um, just, to, just to go through, I think, for, um, for us as, a, as an emergency program, so that emergency, so that there's a, you're basically saying that there's an association between myocarditis type thing, presenting with heart failure or heart-related symptoms, and COVID. Um, from our terms, practically, does it really matter? Does it really matter if there is COVID myocarditis or COVID illness associated with heart failure from myocardial injury from another cause? Uh, no, I, you know, I think for your intents and purposes, I, I don't think it makes it. The, 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 I think the biggest difference it makes is in the acute setting, if somebody presents with COVID and chest pain and ECG changes, I think the most important thing for you to decide, as I had alluded to, is is this person infarcting or is this something else? And it's not an easy distinction to make, you know, because as you, as I said, you know, these myocarditis can look like anything. But saying that, I think you, you're more inclined to, to give them the benefit of the doubt and treat the acute coronary syndrome, especially if they've got acute, uh, you know, ongoing chest pain and the suspicion is high, that you deal with that first, you know. I think the whole story with, with the myocarditis and the COVID, that tend to happen later in the course of the infection, as I've shown that little diagram when your that cytokine storm thing takes over. And it will probably be something that more concerns us and the physicians and the ICU um, sort of physicians in managing them in the long term. We, we, we know there's no good treatment. We just give them steroids. I, I, haven't, I haven't treated one yet. So we've never been consulted with one. But I think for you guys, it's the important thing is to distinct acute coronary syndrome, specifically STEMI, uh, versus, um, you know, is this a myocarditis? And I think that in our setting, it's probably better that we treat most people as acute coronary syndrome. Obviously, if they're doubts in your mind, you know, you're more than welcome to phone us. And I always we put two, three brains together. We all look at these things, and we might come up with a better answer than 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 just one person struggling in the middle of nowhere type of a thing. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with that. So, um, guys, if anybody has any questions for Karim, you can please pop your camera on um, so that we know you're. You, you, can, you want to ask a question, um, and then we can have it to you. I think Davis put something up. Otherwise, I mean, I could talk for hours with Karim on this stuff. Um, uh, so, Karim, just one more thing with related to, to, to your case that you had. You said you think the doctor did a good job in, in emergency care. If you could have a wish list for us as emergency physicians packaging or sending you a case. Um, so we mostly work in a hospital that has, you know, we, we have access to um, more advanced bloods and you know we can do reasonably safe intubations in COVID. What would a wish list from a cardiologist be for a patient suspected of chest pain and COVID of a cardiac etiology? I mean we're leaving PE out of this discussion altogether. That's an entire separate topic. Um, so what would you think? Yeah, I, I think I think the most important thing you know is that you look after yourselves first. I think that is the most important thing. I, I think you know, mo most, if not all, the patients that we receive from you guys, you know, we've had very good referrals. You know, usually it's not stuff that's hanging in the air and those type of things. Um, but for PPE, obviously, if you know you're going to get into a resource, I think, you know, in this time, as I said, you know, you, you really have to look after yourselves first. Um, the one thing that may help us is, I think, speak to us earlier rather than later. As I said, you know, two or three of us put our minds together. Believe it or not, we're not assholes. Um, some of us are, 
me maybe Lloyd not so much so it just depends on uh, it depends on who you get on the phone but well, you know we we generally helpful people and I think if you're not sure and you're struggling you know and you think that it may be or may not be give us a ring you know we can think through it and those type of things but besides that I think we need to decide on management early obviously time is myocardium type of a thing and we shouldn't wait hours and hours making a decision we should rather make that decision earlier than later so it's 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 not with by the time they get to in instead of you know treating them we trying to salvage something i don't want it to be like that so I think yeah that, that sort of would be my message. Um, um, I, I mean I can't speak for what happens on the other side of the lease bit, but um, with us you're more than welcome to call us at any time. Um, I see Luke's got your hand up. Luke, do you have a question? And then we've got a similar question from Emily and Dave. Um, Kevin, just with regards to that case, the guy hadn't didn't have any symptoms. He'd been sick a few weeks before. I mean, we've sort of following guidance that people are better at about 14 days or should be no longer infected between 10 and 14 days. Does that change how you sort of, obviously this is a del possibly delayed, he's had a type 1 MI, uh, there's been an occlusion, it's quite typical, but the inflammatory response, mm. is it quite, I mean, is it important to know where they are in the disease process? Right, um, so, so yeah. does that change what you do? Yeah. I, 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 you know, we have a patient, I, I actually didn't stick it on my slides because I didn't think of it. So we, we actually have a patient um, who had in the ward now who's been de-isolated, you know, looked like he may have had an infarct um, two weeks ago or whatever. There's a lot of troponin lead, sunny region, all motion abnormalities. Uh, we decided to take him over because there is a suspicion that is this a myocarditis, he's got a small pericardial effusion. The, the issue is, you know, I, I, I know, you know, from, from looking at it from one way, we know after 14 days, they become sort of non-infectious type of a thing. But at the same time, our current guidelines with regards to AC elevation myocardial infarctions is if your artery has been closed for more than 48 hours, we shouldn't open it because we're potentially causing more injury as, as a result of reperfusion. Uh, so we might not necessarily be doing you a favor. It's a very difficult decision to make, you know. So I think that in him, you know, we, we obviously couldn't get a full history. His son ended up telling us that he had symptoms. But because the course was so malignant, you know, I think he had four VFRS, he had cardiogenic shock. We knew that it was a proximal LAD. Uh, we didn't know it was a left main until I decided to put my second pair of gloves on and second pair of underpants. Um, um, but I think in him, we, we didn't have a choice, but to take him to the cath lab and have a look and see what we have and try and get him out as quickly as possible, obviously with full PPE and minimal exposure type of a thing. So, you know, I, I offered to scrub because I, I had the youngest child out of, the, out, of, uh, out of everybody and my child probably doesn't even know who I am yet. So I thought, you know, it's cool. Let me just cast this, okay. Uh, but obviously, you know, because it's a left main and I am not the left main specialist by any means, um, Fonny Picararo actually got dressed also in full PP and came in and, you know, we had, we, we at least had some backup on the inside, but I think in him, it was, we had to take him to the lab, but in patients who are thrombolized and they had good result and, you know, they're pain free type of a thing, uh, if they have COVID potentially, we could think about waiting uh, and see what we have. Uh, but I think, you know, we should make that on a case-by-case -case basis. Obviously, you know, an 80-year-old with COVID and now has a STEMI but is pain-free and had good result in lysis, we're probably more inclined to say, you know, let's hold on, let's see what we have type of a thing, compared to like a 40-year-old that, you know, had a raging LAD STEMI but you do have COVID as well. Um, we will just have to take precautions on our side and try and do... Uh, the job as quickly as possible and get them out of the lab as quickly as possible type of a thing. Yeah. I don't know if that answers your question, sorry. Yeah, I think the message that we're getting from this is that it shouldn't be one decision made by one person in isolation. Um, so we've got a question here, so the same theme from the group. Um, I think you might have touched on it in your presentation, but if you don't mind just answering the... Um, so the question is about myocarditis in uh, being diagnosed in the EC. So say you have a however certain you are 
that they've diagnosed the myocarditis in a patient um, COVID positive in the emergency center with raising um, inflammatory markers. So the question relates to whether we should consider starting steroids. Um, I'm guessing this is a, possibly a simulation yeah. patient or... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, this is a, a difficult question. Uh, I think, um, you know, in, in the COVID time, the, 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 as I said, the basis of a diagnosis of myocarditis is an endomyocardial biopsy to prove that there's inflammatory infiltrates. Um, and we, when I say we, I probably just mean me, but I can convince one or two other people in, in on the floor. You know, I, I would be interested in going in to have a look. You know, if the provided the patient is stable enough and it's not on a ventilator and those type of things, um, I, I would I would be interested to go and and you know, not do the diagnosis just based on an echo, but have a bit more evidence. Um, you know, before we go with that. Obviously, on the other hand, if you have a patient who is intubated, who is in cardiogenic shock, who's got a very bad ventricle, has COVID and has troponins, you know, in the thousands and going up and is, you know, in a very bad way, I suppose it wouldn't necessarily be wrong for you as a sort of a kitchen sink type scenario, do nothing, they die, do something, they may live type of a thing, to then consider steroids. Once again, I think, you know, depending on your drainage area, um, you very much more than welcome to call me or call us or whatever, and we can look at everything, and then I think we can take a decision together. I don't think it's you know sort of like a decision that needs to be taken immediately. I think that you know we can all sit and I can speak to a couple of consultants here. We can gather thoughts from a couple of people and see what we have type of a thing. So I think. Once again, you know, as with the decisions about STEMIs and those type of things, I don't think this should be an individual decision, uh, mostly because, you know, COVID has really, you know, made everybody a bit, um, uh, made things a little bit crazy. And I think that it's sometimes helpful to, 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 to have a couple more opinions as to what we should do. Maybe there's something that nobody's thought of type of thing. Uh, the one other thing I just wanted to mention is all these patients that did get um, high-dose steroids, they also got a course of high-dose IVIG. Now, you all know that I give IVIG to patients with power B19 or Alboka virus myocarditis um, type of a thing. Uh, it's thought to have an immunomodulatory type of property that goes along with the steroids. Uh, and once again, these patients that got those things also got chloroquine and they also got uh, lopinavirutonavir. So it was pretty much a kitchen sink type scenario. Just throw everything at them and see kind of what happens type of a thing. <laughs> Sorry. But yeah, I, I think it should, you know, you, I think you're more than welcome to speak to us about it. And we can look at all the imaging and we can see all the data that we have. And then we can come to the decision as to what would be best, you know. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I'm not seeing any cameras on yet. I'm not seeing any questions come up in the group. So it looks like everybody's um, either they're having technical issues or, you know, we're not being able to get. Guys, if you can't get a message in here, you, while we have Karim on, um, I think as a last result, you can populate the chat in the group. Um, just to touch on, so, you know, Karim, we've been chatting about this. Um, so I know you do adults only. Um, but, you know, the CDC has now changed the, the, the case definition for that so-called, you know, the Kawasaki-like picture yeah. in kids with um, the so-called vasculitis, which is delayed onset um, up to 21 years of age. So obviously these are not going to go to Red Cross or to Tiger Road to ground. Um, so, you know, I see tw 21 is obviously an arb cutoff, right? No disease knows that you're 21 or 21.5. So there's probably going to be some sort of an overlap, and that's probably something that we're going to see in an emergency room as well, in terms of this four up to four weeks of an exposure to someone that has been suspected of COVID, presenting with acute heart failure um, in a in a young adult. Um, so I mean, the presentation of that and the management is probably going to be a bit different. Um, but is that something that you know we, we can chat to cardiology as well, or uh, you know how? I, you know, I I, I think so, I man. I, I mean, I, I would be very interested. You know, if you, you, you've you got, you, most of you have my numbers. You're more than welcome to call me, not three o'clock in the morning, but, you know, during office hours, uh, unless you want to, you know, speak about your emotions or something. But don't call me about, at three o'clock in the morning about work 
Um, but you know, you're more than welcome to call me. And then I think, you know, a patient in like that should probably be managed in a tertiary center, you know, with inputs of the infectious diseases specialists. Uh, we will probably know a little bit more about these things uh, and multiple other specialties. And I think, you know, um, yeah, we'll, we'll, you're way more than welcome to speak to. I'm interested, I'm always interested. Besides amyloid codiasis, I am also interested in other things. Okay, geez, thanks, Karim. I mean, we, you're clearly coming to us directly from the cat lab. So, guys, if there's no other questions, I think we're gonna, um, you know, allow Karim to continue saving lives in his in his. What, by the way, what are you doing in the cat lab now? You clearly your numbers have gone down. I'm guessing. Yeah, we. I mean, we're not doing well. We're starting to slowly bring the elected cases back. Um, there was a time where we were doing one two cases a day. There are still days where we're doing one two cases a day, uh, but it is picking up. I think. You know, I think worldwide they've seen, everywhere, they've seen a drop off of STEMI presentations and acute coronary presentations um, and the amount of angiograms done. But I don't think that people are not infarcting just because they're COVID. It's just that we are going to now pick them up at a later stage where they come in with scar VT or they come in with ischemic cardiomyopathies and those type of things, which are things that we would like to avoid. Um, but I think they are out there. They're just waiting for the lockdown to finish. So I suspect on Monday next week, we're going to get like 50 patients. Uh, hopefully I'm not on call. I'm sitting next to the guy who's making a roster. I'm just, you know, I'm, it's not a, it's, I'm just saying, Monday's not a good day for me to be on call. But I think they will come back. And I think, you know, hopefully we don't see too many late complications. But I know in New York and stuff, they've, they've seen things that they haven't seen for a long time, post-infarction, VSD, free wall rupture, because they're so good with reperfusion that they don't really see these things anymore, but they are starting to come back because people are scared. Uh, when you're scared, then you get a Takotsubo as well, so it's like a double hit by the thing. Yeah, you mean you as a provider get a Takotsubo? Right? We all get Takotsubo, so I think. Yeah. No, thank you. Um, yeah, thanks, Karim. I mean, the, 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 you know, we, we read about that paper in Italy that showed that the sort of Minoka rates have gone up. So whether that's a pseudo variant of, I mean, a, a surrogate marker to say that, um, you know, the coronary is actually leading to some other illness. And then also the sort of graph that shows you that, yes, your STEMI presentations are going down, but they, so a lot of them are being converted into this out of hospital cardiac arrest. Yeah. And obviously bystander the CPR rates have dropped down in the face of COVID and so, you know, that's no, no, part of the issue. It's a, it's a multiple issue, you know. Anyway, thank you so much for your time. Um, and nobody else has any, any questions here, but I, I'm sure people are going to take you up on their offer when they get stuck at 3 o'clock in the morning with the ECGs. And we are going yeah. to publish your, your number, name, detail, everything on Facebook. Um, so you can be our new cardio Twitter. <laughs> thanks, Karim. Well, thanks, guys. Thanks very much.